questions. So go ahead, Governor. try again. Good morning. Senior Deputy Governor Wilkins and I are very pleased to be with you to answer your questions about today's policy announcement and monetary policy report. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused an unprecedented fall in economic activity in Canada, and the recovery will require considerable monetary policy support. Our overriding message to Canadians is that the bank will be there to provide monetary stimulus for an extended period to support the recovery and to return inflation to the 2% target. Before I turn to your questions, let me say a few words about the key points of the Governing Council's deliberations. Nos discussions ont encore été axées sur le coronavirus. Cette pandémie est une catastrophe humaine et économique. Elle coûte des vies et il fait perdre des emplois. Durant la première moitié de l'année, l'économie mondiale a connu son plus important recul depuis la Grande Dépression. Les mesures pour contenir le virus sont en train d'être levées à bien des endroits, et l'activité économique commence à se raffermir. Mais comme on le voit aux États-Unis, de nouvelles poussées de virus peuvent nécessiter un reconfinement nuisant À la reprise. We are facing many uncertainties, the biggest of which is the unknowable course of the virus itself. As a result, we cannot forecast with the usual degree of accuracy on our economic projections. Recognizing this, we decided to present a central economic scenario. The central scenario tries to balance the likelihood of better and worse outcomes, but it is highly conditional on the assumptions about the virus. In particular, we assume there will not be a broad-based second wave here in Canada, and most of the containment measures are lifted gradually. We also assume that the pandemic will have largely run its course by the middle of 2022, because either a vaccine or an effective treatment is widely available by then. Our policy discussions were guided by this scenario while recognizing the extreme uncertainty around these assumptions. In the central scenario, the Canadian economy shrinks by almost 8% this year, then grows by just over 5% in 2021 and by almost 4% in 2022. Now let me give you some context. Recent monthly data, particularly on employment, motor vehicles, motor vehicle sales and housing, suggests that the Canadian economy hit bottom in April. Growth, job growth resumed in May and accelerated in June. We now estimate that the economy contracted about 15% in the first half of this year. As deep as this is, it suggests the economy has avoided the most dire scenarios we laid out in the April monetary policy report. In the third quarter, we expect to continue to see a strong rebound in jobs and output. Mais il est clair pour tous les membres du conseil de direction que cette récession n'est pas habituelle. Nous pensons que la croissance à court terme exceptionne nellement fort pendant la réouverture et sera probablement suivi d'une récupération plus lente et inégale. Il faudra donc beaucoup de temps pour que l'activité économique revienne même à ce niveau de la fin de 2019 avant que la pandémie frappe. There are many reasons why the recuperation phase may be protracted. Some businesses will close. Well, others will be unable to return to pre-pandemic levels of activity. Business and consumer confidence have been shaken and consumers are, unlike, are likely to be cautious with their spending. And many people may find it hard to return to work, particularly if schools and child childcare facilities cannot fully reopen. We recognize that the burden of this challenge falls disproportionately on women. Quand le confinement a été Imposé afin d'aplatir la courbe, le gouvernement a vite réagi. Il a pris des mesures pour remplacer les revenus perdus et aider les entreprises à garder leur personnel et à payer leurs factures. Certaines de ces mesures ont été prolongées et de nouvelles ont été annoncées 
depuis le début de juin. Elles ont atténué les pires effets de la pandémie pour les ménages et les entreprises et jeté les bases de la reprise. The bank's actions were also unprecedented. We lowered the policy rate to the effective lower bound of 25 basis points and launched a range of liquidity facilities and purchase programs to keep markets functioning. This kept credit flowing and supported confidence. With core markets normalizing, we have scaled back some of the short-term liquidity facilities, but we are ready to step these programs back up if warranted. As always, our policy actions are grounded in our inflation targeting mandate. The pandemic is imposing uncertainty on inflation itself. Because spending patterns have changed, the consumer price index doesn't ac accurately represent the spending habits of Canadians right now. So the bank has been working with Statistics Canada to create an adjusted price index that better captures today's consumption patterns. We talk about this in box two of the monetary policy report. The adjusted price index shows that inflation is probably not as low as the official CPI suggests, although the difference is not large. In the past couple of months, inflation by either measure has been close to zero. We expect it to remain below target while low prices for gasoline, clothing, travel, and other items are pulling it down and while demand is weak. The pandemic has reduced both supply and demand in the economy, but we judge that the effects on demand are larger. As demand recovers and economic slack is absorbed, inflation will gradually move back up towards our 2% target. Governing Council also discussed the role of our extended toolkit is playing in supporting the economy. Our purchase programs were initially aimed at improving market functioning and unclogging the financial system, allowing monetary policy, allowing the monetary policy transmission to work as it should. With that objective largely achieved and the economy reopening, these programs, particularly the large-scale purchases of, of Government of Canada bonds, are now working through more channels, which we elaborate on in the NPR. The combination of, very, of a very low policy rate and asset purchases is providing considerable monetary stimulus. En résumé, l'économie canadienne a subi un choc historique et la réponse des autorités devrait aussi être historique. Les premiers signes positifs se dégagent la réouverture mais la récupération s'annonce inégale et longue. To sum up, the Canadian economy has hit, been hit by an unprecedented shock, which has demanded an historic response. The early signs from the reopening phase are positive, but we expect the recuperation phase to be bumpy and protracted. As the economy moves from reopening to recuperation, it will continue to require extraordinary monetary policy stimulus. The Governing Council will hold the policy interest rate at the effective lower bound until economic slack is absorbed, so the 2% inflation target is sustainably achieved. In addition, to reinforce this commitment and keep interest rates low across the yield curve, the bank is continuing its large-scale asset purchase program at a pace of at least $5 billion per week of Government of Canada bonds. This quantitative easing program is making borrowing more affordable for households and businesses and will continue until the recovery is well underway. To support the recovery and achieve the inflation objective, the bank is prepared to provide further monetary policy stimulus as needed. With that, Senior Deputy Governor Wilkins and I would be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you, Governor. We'll go to questions now. Uh, we'll do one question and a follow-up. Please state your name and affiliation. I just want to remind people before we get started to mute their line if they're not asking a question uh, on the teleconference. You can mute your line by pressing star six and unmute by pressing star seven. Avant de poser une question, veuillez vous identifier. Libre à vous de poser vos questions dans la langue officielle de votre choix. Pour mettre votre ligne en mode discrétion, appuyez sur l'étoile 6. Pour l'enlever, faites étoile 7. Uh, the first question is from Kelsey Johnson of Reuters, and she will be followed by Kim and then Dave Parkinson. Go ahead, Kelsey. 
Uh, thank you, Governor, for taking our questions. Um, my first question is, with coronavirus cases spiking in large U.S. states like California, Florida, and Texas, and some states are rolling back their reopenings and even moving back to broader shutdowns, how much will Canada's recovery be delayed or slowed because of this? Uh, in, in the last couple of weeks, with the uh, rapid rise in, in cases of coronavirus in the U.S., we, we did uh, last projection. You'll see in the monetary policy report um, the contraction in, in the U.S. and Canada this year uh, is about the same, but uh, Canada is projected to grow in the central scenario uh, faster uh, coming out than the U.S., uh, that that does spill back into Canada. Uh, exports to the United States are, are an important component of GDP in Canada, uh, and we have taken that into account in the central scenario. Uh, I would underline that there's a lot of uncertainty around that scenario, and the principal source of the uncertainty is the the evolution of the coronavirus itself. As a follow-up, um, why is the bank now providing some guidance on how long its policy rate could be at the lower bound? Uh, forward guidance is in our uh, extended toolkit, and we have seen a historic drop in economic activity in the first half of this year. It's going to be a long climb out, and we recognize that households and businesses are facing an unusual amount of uncertainty. Against that background, uh, we are being unusually clear that interest rates are going to be low for a long time. Uh, and we judge uh, that combined with uh, the reinforcement through quantitative easing provides an appropriate degree of monetary policy to support the recovery. Thank you. The next question is from Kim. Hi, thanks. Uh, this is Kim McCrail from the Wall Street Journal. Um, can, can you just elaborate a little bit further, uh, following up on Kelsey's second question there, on what you'd like people to take from uh, the forward, forward guidance that was, was offered, um, just a little bit more explicitly on what you would like someone to, to understand about the path of, of the interest rate? of the key interest rate. As we elaborated uh, at some length in the monetary policy report, we, we see the recovery proceeding in two phases. A first, uh, a first phase, the reopening phase, where we expect to see a, a pretty strong bounce back in growth, followed by a slower, uh, more protracted, bumpier uh, recuperation phase. Our message is that uh, it's going to be a long climb back and the Bank of Canada is going to be there through the full length of the recovery uh, until uh, economic slack is absorbed so that uh, we achieve our inflation target. Uh, the message is interest rates are going to be low for an extended period. Thanks. And um, I, I just wanted to touch on uh, the, there's a comment in the monetary policy report that uh, in the global economic outlook section that says the risks are tilted to the downside in terms of the central scenario provided by the bank, particularly around a possible second wave. Uh, can you elaborate on, on that and explain, does, it, does that also translate to the risks in terms of being tilted to the downside for the domestic economy and how big is that risk? So we've, we haven't produced a regular projection. We produced a central scenario. And the, the reason for that is to highlight that uh, our outlook is highly conditional on the evolution of the virus itself. Uh, we've assumed in, in, in this central scenario there is no widespread second wave, uh, and, and hence there's no widespread uh, second lockdown. We do anticipate uh, that there will be localized uh, flare-ups of the virus and there will need to be localized uh, localized restrictions. It's going to be very important that we're all well prepared uh, for flare-ups in the virus. Um, the 
uh, and we've been pretty cautious in our assumptions about uh, when when a, a vaccine or uh, effective medications will be available. Uh, we don't expect that uh, in the central scenario uh, for about two years. Um, when you look, when, clearly there's a lot of uncertainty about these assumptions. Uh, there could be a second wave uh, that requires a broad-based uh, lockdown. Uh, and if that happens, we'd certainly be knocked off our central scenario. We'd be well below the central scenario, uh, and that would imply we would need more monetary policy stimulus uh, to get back to our inflation target. On the other side, uh, a vaccine could be developed or effective medications uh, may be developed more quickly, uh, yeah, in which case uh, the recovery uh, would happen faster. Um, when we, the reason Yes, as you've outlined, uh, risks are tilted to the downside really because uh, of the possibility of a second wave and, and the serious consequences that would have if it required a second widespread lockdown. Okay, we've got um, Dave Parkinson, Greg and Heather are next on the list. So go ahead, Dave. Um, good morning, Governor. Um, wanted to uh, ask about uh, you know the continuation of the QE program and uh, obviously with with the uh, the intent pivoting from uh, from market stability um, to uh, to stimulus um, wondering if there were <clears throat> excuse me if there were discussions among the uh, the governing council about um, about making adjustments either in the size or in the uh, you know the specific direction of of those purchases in order to uh, um, I guess to fine tune them to uh, to, to more accurately uh, provide stimulus rather than uh, than market stability. If there was you know any talk about uh, about making changes along those lines, and if so, what uh, what was uh, the nature of those and what was concluded? Uh, we did discuss uh, how much monetary policy stimulus is in place. We we also discussed uh, the the tools in our extended toolkit. Uh, we discussed forward guidance. We discussed LSAPs. We discussed yield curve control. Um, where we landed was that uh, forward guidance, as we provided together. Uh, with a continued commitment to uh, large-scale asset purchases, uh, quantitative easing, if you will, uh, at a scale of at least $5 billion uh, a week, uh, Government of Canada bonds uh, would reinforce the forward guidance and provide the stimulus that we see uh, the economy needs. Um, and, and we indicated that the, the, that quantitative easing program would uh, continue until the uh, recovery is well underway. Um, thanks. I also wanted to ask about uh, the outlook for um, uh, for business closures, uh, capacity destruction. Um, do you have at this point any sort of feel uh, for um, you know how much uh, you know what the depth of, of capacity destruction might uh, might be or it, um, you know, is, uh, if, if you don't have a sense of how much that's going to be, how long will it take before we'll have yeah. a good feel for that? I'm going to ask um, Senior Deputy Governor Wilkins to say a few words about this. We have a, a quite an extensive box in the, the in the NPR on that. Uh, we've in that box we we uh, do our best to estimate uh, the supply implications of the lockdown and the, the uh, potential path of supply going forward. I think the you know, the, the key takeaway is that demand is falling more than supply. So there is, you know, inflation's already around zero and there's considerable downward pr pressure on inflation. But I'll turn to uh, Senior Deputy Wilkins to say a bit more about the supply profile. So it's an excellent question because it's going to be critical for us in our reading of the economy and the underlying inflation and disinflationary uh, pressures that are there. Uh, in the box, what we attempt to do, as, uh, as the governor pointed out, was, was uh, have an estimate of what we think supply will be going forward to the end of 22 and benchmark it relative to what we thought it would have been in January. And you know, what we expect to see is that we'll have uh, about 3 to 4 percent on the level less supply at the end of 2022 than we thought we would, primarily because 
uh, businesses may, may never open uh, that were there, so there'd be lost capacity. The capacity may still be there, but the businesses may not be open. And thirdly, there may be less uh, labor supply than we thought we had because of uh, changes to immigration, the immigration profile, uh, and also because there may be some workers that have not yet been able to enter back into the labor force. So all told, um, this could be some uh, very long lasting implications for supply, but we are quite, uh, we are quite uh, wedded to the idea that demand is, is going to be even a bigger issue. And so overall, the, the pressures on inflation will be on the downside. Thank you. The next question is from Heather. Go ahead, Heather. I apologize that the next question is actually Greg. I skipped over Greg. Sorry about that. Good morning. You can hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Oh, th thank you. Uh, uh, Governor, you, you said that uh, QE will be maintained until the recovery is well underway and that interest rates will stay stay near zero until uh, inflation is stable around your target. Does that suggest that QE could be scaled back well before you raise interest rates? Um, so first of all, uh, I, I'd highlight that uh, you know, we provide a central scenario rather than a projection reflecting uh, the uncertainty. It, it's it's very difficult to put any of these things on a calendar. Uh, what we indicate is that you know, interest rates will uh, remain at the effective lower bound until capacity is absorbed and uh, inflation is uh, on target. Uh, and that is reinforced by quantitative easing uh, until the uh, recovery is well underway. Um, both of those are some ways off. Uh, we have, uh, a, a f after a sort of quick bounce back, we have a fairly long, slow recovery. Uh, and when we say uh, the recovery is well underway, uh, that is beyond the reopening phase, which we expect to be fairly strong. Uh, it's somewhere uh, in that recuperation phase. And what we'll, we will be looking for is we will be looking for signs that uh, the uh, the recovery is becoming more self-sustaining. Uh, I think logically, yes, uh, the recovery being well underway uh, comes before, uh, becomes before uh, capacity has been fully absorbed, uh, but both of those are some ways off. And uh, you know, we, we have the tools uh, that we need uh, to exit when the time comes, uh, but that is, is, is uh, some ways into the future. Thank you. Uh, secondly, on, on the fiscal side of the equation, you know, we've all seen the, the government's uh, record deficit. Do we still need massive fiscal stimulus going forward? And, and from a point of view of, of Bank of Canada independence, is there any point where it becomes more uncomfortable to continue buying uh, federal government bonds, given the, the perceptions about a conflict that could arise? Okay, well, you managed to pack a lot into one question. Um, on, on the first part, uh, the government uh, has played a leading role in responding to this crisis uh, with, with programs to support, uh, replace incomes that have been lost due to COVID for both households and businesses. Uh, the wage subsidy program is, is keeping, uh, is, is supporting companies and workers and keeping workers uh, connected with their, their employer, which will be helpful uh, to, to support uh, more rapid rehiring as we move forward. And that program has just been extended. These programs uh, are uh, playing a critical role uh, to support households and businesses. Uh, they're laying the foundation for recovery and, and will support the economy uh, through recovery. Uh, with respect to monetary policy, our monetary policy is guided by uh, our inflation target. Uh, QE, uh, large-scale asset purchases, are uh, an important tool in our extended toolkit. 
Uh, and in a situation where we're, we're at the effective lower bound on interest rates, uh, QE uh, is an alternative way of lowering interest rates further out the yield curve. Uh, it is our judgment that that additional stimulus is needed to bring inflation back to target. And uh, you know, as an independent central bank, uh, we are pursuing our inflation target, which is jointly agreed uh, with the government of Canada. I've got Heather, Eric, and then Jordan. So Heather, you're up. Uh, good morning. Um, so uh, throughout the report, uh, from the monetary policy report, you, you talk a few times about uh, fear and uncertainty, fear of catching the virus and uncertainty about, about job loss compounding the economic weakness. I'm wondering how you quantify that in your central scenario and, and, and what kind of factors change the trajectory of that and how it affects uh, growth? Um, well, it, it is a difficult thing to quantify uh, in the in the central scenario, the the virus is not something that we have any historical data on that we can. Uh, so there is a certain amount of judgment uh, involved, uh, but we we can look back at at other uh, disasters and and uh, see what has happened to confidence. You know, the reality is, Heather, uh, the virus is going to be with us for some time. Uh, in the central scenario, uh, we assume it, it's there really for the for the for the full projection period uh, of about two years. Uh, that we, we you know through this period, we are going to have to continue to physically distance. Uh, companies are going to need to figure out how to get their workers back safely, how to serve customers safely. Um, uh, individuals are probably going to be cautious about. In fact, I hope they are cautious about certain activities um, because uh, they don't want to get sick. Uh, they're all, there's also going to be ongoing uncertainty um, about employment. Uh, some companies, unfortunately, uh, will go bankrupt. They're not going to make it to the other side of this. Um, households will naturally be concerned about their job security, uh, and that may lead them to hold uh, more precautionary savings. Uh, so these are factors that will uh, restrain the speed of the recovery, uh, and they're an important reason why uh, our view is that there's going to need to be monetary policy stimulus uh, for an extended period to support the, the recovery through the full length of the recovery. Okay, thanks. Um, and um, just to, to pick up on the discussion of, of, of box three on page 24 about about the um, the uh, permanent damage to the economy, um, you know, you discuss the uh, the contraction of the labor supply because of immigration levels. Um, but you know, off the top, you mentioned that the burden of uh, of the the labor loss has fallen on women, and I'm wondering. Um, how did, uh, you know, are you looking at the long-term effects of mothers being squeezed out of the workforce uh, more permanently and how that affects the workforce going further? Um, and if, you, if, if it's not as part of that scenario, is that because it's an oversight or is it just because it's too marginal to read a mention? Uh, I certainly wouldn't say it's too marginal. I, I think uh, families are facing real challenges. Um, hopefully, as uh, you know, this virus uh, progresses, we get better and better at managing it. And uh, I certainly hope we can, can re find a way to reopen schools and, and, and get daycare back to work. Uh, but yes, uh, you know, I, I won't say that we've got a precise estimate of what that effect is, but uh, you know, rolled into um, the supply effects, uh, we include a range of things and, and that would be one of them. You know, what you see in the box is that uh, supply has uh, plummeted, I think it's about 60% of the drop uh, in output in Q2 is reflecting restrictions in supply. So right now, uh, or, or well, we're into the third quarter, but you know, go back a month, those effects were very acute. They're starting to uh, come off, but you'll see in, in, in uh, this box three that uh, they come off pretty gradually. Eric? Thanks. Eric, you're next. 
Good morning, Governor. Uh, I'd, I'd like you to uh, spend a little bit more uh, time explaining uh, what is meant by sustainably achieved in the context of, of the inflation target. Uh, so to both parts of that sentence are very important. Uh, that excess capacity is absorbed. Or I think we say economic slack uh, is, is, is absorbed so that inflation uh, is sustainably at our 2% target. And what that means is that um, in order for inflation to be sustainably uh, at the 2% target, in other words, fluctuating uh, closely around the target, uh, output needs to be uh, very close to potential. Uh, we have to abs have absorbed the excess capacity. If we still have a lot of slack in the economy, uh, even if inflation temporarily gets back to two, it will fall back down below two. That is not sustainably at the 2% target. Eric, do you have a follow-up? Yes, just to follow up, uh, talking about uh, yield curve control uh, or potentially raising bond purchases, are these still in the toolkit? And uh, what would come first? Uh, we, we, we discussed these, uh, you know, we, we discussed these issues and, and, and uh, I'll ask Senior, Senior Deputy Governor Wilkins was, of course, part of those discussions, so I'll, I'll ask her to say a few words as well. Uh, we discussed, we discussed uh, the tools in, in the extended toolkit, including forward guidance, including the size of the quantitative easing LSAP program, uh, as well as yield curve control. Um, we, we've done some research on yield curve control and, and uh, senior deputy can say a word about that. There, you know, LSAPs and yield curve control both involve buying, um, you know, both involve large scale purchases of Government of Canada bonds. And the difference is uh, with LSAPs or QE, uh, typically the, the, uh, you announce an amount so in our case, a minimum of $5 billion a week. Uh, in the case of yield curve control, uh, you announce uh, a point in the yield curve, uh, an interest rate on the yield curve uh, that you want to target. Um, and um, yeah, maybe I'll turn it to Senior Deputy Governor Wilkins to say a little bit more about what we talked about. Sure. Uh, so we did talk about the two different approaches to providing monetary stimulus when we're at the effective lower bound. and. And when we thought about our current quantitative easing program in the context of the, where the yield curve is today, uh, it, it, uh, it was our judgment that this, this program would be very helpful uh, with a minimum of $5 billion a week uh, to, uh, to achieving our monetary policy goals. And the intent, it's, it's not just about the $5 billion or whatever we end up buying, it's about what you actually purchase. And so our purchases are aimed at across the yield curve in a way that's somewhat proportionate to uh, the amount outstanding and what's being issued. You'll notice that the federal government just announced its, uh, its uh, bond issuance plan for this year, debt issuance plan for this year. And so uh, we will continue to monitor uh, our, our, the effects of our purchases and, and, uh, and adjust uh, as, as required to meet our objectives, which I just want to remind everyone, Governor's done it a couple of times, are squarely aimed at our inflation target. Thank you. I've got Jordan, Kevin, and then Tony. Just a reminder to state your full name and your affiliation, please. Jordan, go ahead. Hi, good morning. It's Jordan Press with the Canadian Press. I wanted to just go back for a moment to your comments about uh, about childcare centers and day and, and schools and, ha and hopefully that they can reopen in the fall. I was wondering if you could just describe a bit what it would mean for the effects on, you know, the, the central planning scenario. What would it mean if schools and childcare centers um, cannot fully reopen in the fall or if those that are uh, able to reopen, what it would mean if they have to close down for maybe localized outbreaks? So in the central scenario, we do uh, envisage a gradual lifting uh, of the uh, containment restrictions. And roughly, uh, we have them uh, 
fully uh, taken off by the end of this year. Uh, we, we, we will, of course, need to continue uh, to, to physically distance, to wash our hands, and, and take uh, sensible precautions. Um, so, and, and also built into the central scenario is uh, the recognition, the reality that there probably will be uh, local uh, flare-ups, uh, there will need to be uh, some local restrictions reimposed, and that's one of the reasons why uh, the recovery is fairly slow th through this recuperation phase. And you're going to have two steps forward, one step back. Um, there, it, it's a matter of degree. Uh, I think if, if schools uh, were, were not to, to reopen, um, that would uh, probably uh, put us on a track uh, somewhat below the central scenario. Um, you, you really, I, I, I'm cautious to put, be too precise on this. You've really got to look at the sum of all the uh, restrictions uh, in, in the economy and, and how much they've come off. You know, I think the bottom line is we've, we've got them coming off gradually. If they have to come off more gradually or if, and if some have to be reimposed uh, more than in the central scenario, you're going to be in a scenario uh, below the central scenario. Thank you. So, just as a as a follow up, then, if you're if for the for the average you know Canadian household trying to navigate its way through the through the scenario that you've outlined in the 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 reopening and then the recuperation phase, um, what is it that maybe is your message to them that you hope they take away from everything that you've laid out today as they try to navigate this, this economic uncertainty that's as large or maybe even larger than the shock that created it. Our message to Canadians is that interest rates are very low and they're going to be there for a long time. Uh, we recognize that uh, Canadians, Canadian businesses are facing an unusual amount of uncertainty. And so we have been unusually clear about the future path for interest rates. If you've got a mortgage uh, or if you're considering to make a major purchase or you're a business and you're considering making an investment, you can be confident that interest rates will be low for a long time. Uh, low interest rates make spending and investment more affordable and spending and investment will support the recovery. That would be our message to Canadians. Kevin. Hi, Kevin Carmichael from Financial Post. Uh, I have a couple of questions related to the, uh, the new adjusted inflation measure. The first one is, um, it, how exactly are you, are, are you using that measure? I guess to put it another way, is, is that the Bank of Canada's new North Star? Is that the new inflation guide that we should all be watching? Um, I'm gonna, I, we, we have a whole box on that in the, in the NPR, and I'm going to ask uh, Senior Deputy Governor Wilkins to say a few words. I will say that um, there's not a huge difference between the two, um, and you know, our target is still, we still target the, the total CPI, we use measures of core inflation, we're looking at this adjusted measure as well. But I'll let uh, Senior Deputy Governor Wilkins elaborate on, on that adjusted uh, CPI inflation measure. Thanks very much, Governor. So, so we, we know in this particular time with COVID that consumers have been adjusting their consumption patterns. They're buying f fewer uh, pieces of clothing. They're traveling less. They are, they are, on the other hand, spending more in their homes, in their shelter. They're spending more in the grocery store. And these, of course, in, would not normally be reflected in the measure of uh, the consumer price index because it's based on a, a set of weights that are kind of an average over, uh, over a period and they're not adjusted very much. And we thought that to get a reading of what people were actually feeling in terms of their consumption experience, it would be important to make those adjustments. And, and we were very... Uh, helpfully working with Statistics Canada to be able to do that, just to keep track of it. 
as the governor said, it, it, you see the weights do change. Uh, it means that in May, just as an example, uh, total CPI was um, 0.3 percentage points lower than this adjusted measure. I think over time, uh, as consumption patterns normalize, uh, these two measures could converge again. But the important thing to know is that, that consumers and households have been telling us uh, for for actually a while in the context of our inflation target renewal that, that they were wondering whether the CPI was actually measured correctly. And so, and so uh, this is just uh, an issue that's just been accentuated. And so we are working hard with Statistics Canada to think about how can we update these weights or how can they update these weights uh, uh, more frequently than they do? And is there any adjustments that need to be made to the weights on a more permanent basis? But that would be in the context of our inflation target renewal. Um, all right, thank you for that. I, I, I'll, I'll come back though to the uh, to the, the the point of my, the original question was, and, and given the explicit guidance you put out today, which two percent uh, should we be paying attention to? The one, uh, the traditional one, the the old CPI, or should we care more about what this adjusted measure is telling us going forward? Our target, Kevin, is for total CPI inflation, and we we use a variety of other measures of inflation, various core measures. We're now looking at this adjusted CPI measure uh, as a way to help guide us on what the future path of total CPI inflation will be. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, Statistics Canada is planning to adjust the weights in total CPI inflation more frequently going forward than in the past. And so um, both for that reason and the fact that as the economy reopens, we expect household spending patterns to go back to something that is more normal, probably not the same as pre-COVID, but uh, will be more normal. For both those reasons, we would expect this adjusted measure uh, and the total CPI, uh, the gap, which is already pretty small to get even more narrow. Thank you. The next question and the last question is from Tony Mace. Go ahead, Tony. Hi, it's Tony Mace. Hi, it's Tony Mace, Beth Mace News. Uh, I want to raise the question, the issue of the Canada-U.S. border closure, um, in particular, the impact on tourism and border communities. And how is that closure affecting your view of the outlook on the downside now? And if it were to reopen, would there be a, a measurable uh, positive effect on the outlook? Um, so uh, the, the border um, trade is, you know, trade trade is happening. Um, the border is closed to to people going back and forth, and, and as you highlighted, uh, that is having a very severe impact on particularly the hospitality uh, industry. Um, and, and you know, this really highlights uh, why this recovery uh, is likely to be uneven. You know, we, we've started to see some very encouraging numbers as the economy's reopened. We've seen something like a, a million and a quarter uh, jobs uh, have, have come back. Uh, and we expect to see uh, some very good uh, numbers uh, through the third quarter as the economy continues to reopen, but not all sectors uh, are going to be able to reopen to the same degree. Uh, some activities like hospitality, uh, like uh, international air travel are probably going to be uh, down uh, for a, quite a long time. Um, you know, the, the, uh, you know, when, the open, when the border opens and, it, and it's uh, safe and advisable for people to travel, uh, that will certainly help the uh, you know help the hospitality travel business uh, but it's got to be safe uh, before uh, that's a sensible thing to do thank you if I could just follow up on uh, the point that a senior deputy governor Wilkins made a moment ago about asset purchases across the yield curve and that you're continuing to monitor their effect and that you might adjust as needed is that to say you might adjust the overall quantity of purchases or 
the composition of purchases across the yield curve or the time required to continue purchases at the current level? Can you just explain what you meant by that, please? Yeah, I meant by that that uh, when we look at the program, we look at a number of parameters. One is the total amount, as you said. Uh, we have committed, though, to a minimum of $5 billion per week until the recovery is well underway. Uh, and so that would be an adjustment over that period on the upside. But there's also adjustments that you that uh, that you might need to make about where particularly on the yield curve uh, that you that you want to concentrate. It, it can depend on the issuance and the changes to the issuance patterns as well as just investor behavior, what their appetite is in different areas. And so and so clearly for 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 the markets and for the transmission of monetary policy, there are some key benchmarks uh, that are of particular interest, and those would all be things. Uh, on our minds. Thank you very much. That concludes today's press conference. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Senior Deputy Governor, and to everybody for joining us. Thank you.